Hey YouTube, welcome. I'm Mike Hedden and I appreciate you stopping by. In uh, Southern California, it's been a rainy weekend, so rainy weekends kind of limit you to cleaning the house, watching a baseball game, maybe an old movie on television, or tying some flies. Well, the Angels don't start until 6 o'clock to play Tampa Bay. Uh, no good movies on. My house, as my grandmother said, is clean enough to be healthy, dirty enough to be comfortable, so I'm good with that. So that leaves fly tying. And uh, today what I thought I'd do is... Uh, tie some nymphs or some pupas or blood worms, whatever you want to call them. But uh, every time I uh, tie a fly, I've got to think of my grandfather. Now, the two most influential men in my life is A, my father, and B, my grandfather. Now, my grandfather loved to, fly, uh, to, to fish, uh, but he was a uh, fly fisherman and a spinning reel fisherman. My father was a spinning reel fisherman when he was working, but became a, a bass fisherman after he retired. And I mean a real bass fisherman. The boat, uh, 40 rods, the best reels. My dad didn't skimp on fishing. And uh, he would go out two, three times a week, and he'd go out seven days a week if he if he had nothing else to do. So both of these men loved to fish. Now I can't really ever tie a fly without thinking of my grandfather. He's the the one that kind of taught me what I know now. You gotta understand this is like 50 years ago. So what he taught me, I'm sure I've, I've forgot most of it, but there's some things that he taught me that I'll never forget. And uh, my grandfather, well, let's just say the youth today would call him old school. Now, <laughs> I take that back. The youth today would call me old school. I don't have a smartphone. I'm not on Facebook uh, or Twitter. And I don't even know what Snapchat and and Pinterest is so uh, I would be old school my grandfather would be considered prehistoric school because my grandfather he was a simple man and I, I, I'm thinking that back in those days everything was a little more simple uh, he believed in taking everything down to the lowest common denominator don't add any frills to anything. And that's what it came to is fishing. Now my grandfather, he tied these flies way back in probably these are at least the 40s or 50s. My, my dad gave them to me when I was in high school in the 60s and uh, I know they were old then. But uh, when it comes down to simple and the, the uh, lowest common denominator. The, these flies kind of prove it. Now, um, back then they didn't have the materials that they have today by no means. So uh, I'm sure that if my grandfather was living today he would be using some of the new stuff. But let me show you what these flies look like and uh, I'll give you an example of what my grandfather's all about. Okay, here's like box one. Now as you can see, most of them are mosquitoes or midges which are like mosquitoes that just don't bite. There's some fly, you know, house flies or whatever and it's maybe uh, uh, a caddis or something like that but most of his flies that he tied were mosquitoes there was some woolly buggers in there and 
things like that, some spinners. But he believed in simple, and that's why most of his flies were were uh, mosquitoes. He liked the dry fly more than nymph fly, or dry fly more than wet fly. And uh, that kind of gives you... Now, these flies here you can see are old and rusty, and they wouldn't catch a $10 fish with a $20 bill. But it doesn't matter. They're not made to fish. This is my, my dad gave these because my grandfather made them. So they will stay in this box for eternity. Now let's get back to tying. So to, today I decided to uh, start. I, I like the nymph fish or wet fly fish from Cabela's I got a box it has no flies in it so I've got a lot of work I want to fill both of these up here sooner or later so I've got my work cut out for, for me I've got my fly homemade fly tying station with my scissors uh, um, all the things that I need my tools Got a couple of magnets underneath to hold my tools so I can get to them real easy. A, a razor blade to keep it out of me, out of harm's way. And, and uh, um, so far I've tied several flies on this uh, and, and it's working pretty good for me. Considering, you know, I got the gift of spinal stenosis, so my hands are dead numb. I can't feel anything. So that makes tie, fly, uh, tying a fly a little harder. So if I can tie a fly, anybody can tie a fly. Today we're going to start out with a blood worm, which is um, the first stages uh, uh, of a mayfly or whatever, and uh, or a midge. And we'll, uh, I've got... Uh, some uh, crystal flash and it's going to be I've got some red uh, but anyway um, I've got uh, I've got a number 12 curved T TMCO hook that I got from uh, Bass Pro in the vise and uh, we're going to be using black thread going to be using S uh, the small scissors. Now, um, scissors, if you ever get into tie flying and you look at the price of some of this stuff, you go, oh man. But scissors, uh, when you first see like a $32 price tag for a small pair of scissors, you will say, oh man. Oh, man. But believe me, scissors... Uh, don't skimp on the scissors, the money on the scissors. Actually, don't skimp on uh, tools. Uh, you'll want bobbins with ceramic uh, inserts. And, and uh, it's best to go a little better on, on the equipment that you use. All right. So let's, uh, let's get going. Now, as I said... My grandfather was a very simple man, and uh, he taught me a lot about fishing simplicity. In other words, one time when I was a kid, I lived in a place called Big Creek, and there was a, a creek called Big Creek. And my grandfather uh, and I were up fishing at one time, and uh, he was up a little farther up the creek, and I, I, I was heading up. And uh, he was laying on his belly on a rock like this, looking down about 10 feet. There was like a three foot waterfall and a two foot waterfall and a nice big pond. So he called me up and I scooted up next to him and we're sitting there looking. And, and in this pond, in the middle, the riffle was coming down through and on the side of the riffle, there were some nice fish just sitting there, just just barely wagging their tails outside the 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 uh, the, the riffle, the the current. And uh, 
my grandfather on that day explained a lot about fish to me. And what he explained was, in the lowest common denominator, fish have three things in their life. They swim, they eat, and they spawn. And that is it. That is a fish's life. There is nothing more. They don't go out to ball games. They don't go bowling. Uh, they don't go out dancing or partying. They swim, they eat, and they spawn. And that's it. And as we were watching those fish, he explained. He says, you may think those fish are lazy being out there. But they're very smart. They're creatures of their domain, and they know what's best, and they're, they're saving energy. Because their tail would barely wag, and they were staying there. And then all of a sudden, something would come down, like a stick or a leaf, and they'd shoot over there and grab it and come back and chew it on and spit it out, and you could see it floating down. So my grandfather said, a trout will mouth almost anything. You know, it will go over there, it will get it, it will come back. If it's not right, it will spit it out. <laughs> so we're sitting there watching, and sure as heck, something come down, a trout go over in that riffle, and boom, and come back out, maybe spit it out or not. But uh, it was amazing watching those fish. And then uh, my grandfather said, uh, go ahead and stand up now. So I stood up on the rock, and as soon as I did, those fish went boom, and they were gone in a flash. I mean, they were gone like lightning. And he says, now, see what you did? You just made those hungry fish not hungry. And when a fish isn't hungry, it's not going to take your, your fake hook. So one of the things about fishing is don't spook the trout. Now, I'm not sure that works with bass. Sometimes I think bass will take anything that goes by them, you know, if it, oh, what's that, boom. But uh, trout will spook, and I learned it that day laying on that rock with my grandfather. So um, I guess uh, uh, I learned something from that. Now, if it's, it's, presentation you, you've got to get the 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 hook in the or, or the uh, fly in the view of the the trout and if you do chances are he's going to go over there and you know test it out see if it's good if, if it's not good so if it's not good he'll probably want to spit it out so that's what the angler has got to be on his toes as soon as as soon as uh, that fish tastes it, you want to set the hook. And there's um, two types of flies. There's the one that float on the water where the fish come up and get it, or there's the one that bounces along the bottom and the, the fish uh, get it. Actually, the fish are kind of, you want it to hit them in the nose. You don't want quite on the bottom. So I, I like nymph fishing, and today we're going to tie some some uh, uh, blood worms or pupas or whatever you, buzzers, whatever you want to call it. We're going to use some red stretch to make the, the blood worm body. We're going to use some, uh, some crystal, uh, crystal uh, thread to give it uh, some ribbing and some shiny effect. And we're going to use some UV... Uh, uh, glue to, to put it all together. Okay. I'm go I've got a number 10 Timco curved nymph hook in the vise. Uh, we're going to use some black thread. I'm going to use the small scissors. Might use a, a bodkin. I'm not sure if we'll need the bodkin. And uh, we'll use the We'll use the whip finisher, and uh, that's probably all the tools we'll need on, on this this uh, very simple blood worm. So why don't I set it up and we I can tie this up now. Getting back to my grandfather on simplicity, 
he told me when he was teaching me how to fly, and, and I want everybody to know I'm not a professional fly tire by no means. As I say, I probably forgot way more than my grandfather taught me. Uh, that's why YouTube is so good. You've got guys like uh, In the Riffle and uh, Davy McVale and uh, Curtis Fry and and Tightline and my favorite is uh, Kelly uh, Kelly uh, Gallup from uh, Slide In. Uh, he reminds me a lot of my grandfather. Not that he's old like my grandfather. He's probably a little younger than me. But he's been tying and selling flies since the 70s. So he knows what he's doing. And he's a no-nonsense kind of guy. He'll just put it out there and, and uh, you know, sh show you exactly what to do. Fly tying is no... It's, it's no rocket science at all. But it does take some practice. And the more you practice like everything else, the better you get. So, uh, I, uh, the, getting to the simple part of my grandfather and tying flies, he told me more than once, don't, don't waste your time tying flies. If, 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 you, if it takes you more than five minutes to tie a fly, you're wasting your time. And if you waste your time, you're wasting your life. Fly, uh, fish aren't that particular, according to my grandfather, on a lot of details. They mouth everything. So the, the secret is get it to look, make it match the hatch if you can. Uh, get it to where they can see it and you'll, and you'll catch some fish. So don't waste you time more than five minutes on a fly that was his philosophy that's my philosophy because he taught me that and that's what I believe in too um, now back when he was tying they didn't have articulated flies that are this long and everything like that those flies are definitely going to take you longer to, to make but a little tiny mosquito on a 16 hook it, 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 it once you get practice it shouldn't take you that long so uh, I'm gonna start on this blood worm and we'll go from there all right let's uh, tie a fly blood worm this is a number 10 tempco nymph hook and I hope my camera will pick it up I don't think my camera's made for this okay we'll start at the eye and work our way back putting a nice even layer of thread onto the bend of the hook Got to be careful not to hit that very sharp hook. These new sh hooks are like wicked sharp, and they will th screw your thread up big time. Okay. Now, the next thing we have to do is tie in some red to make it look like a blood worm. nice tight ties then the gold same thing a couple of nice tight ties to keep the gold yeah. We will cut this and cut that without cutting the, the thread. And 
then we will wrap this all the way up to the eye. Now this is very thin thread, so we've got to have a nice bulbous head. Uh, going to build it up with just wraps of thread. And then we'll keep it up here like this. All right. Now we're going to start wrapping the red around. My granddad called this touch and roll. Take it all the way up to the eye to make it look like a nice bloody worm. Can't let this go at all if you miss it. It will unravel on you all the way back and you'll have to start again. When we get here, we'll just put a nice couple of wraps on it. Take the scissors. Cut those. And as I say, we need the nice blood uh, black head. So we'll start building it up. Okay, now for the ribbing. Whoops, that wasn't good. I think I might have to put a half hitch on this to keep it from sliding. And my grandfather, he called this barber pulling. Just want to barber pull it right on up. Keep it kind of spaced as good as you can. Again, put a couple of nice wraps around it. This is uh, building up the bulbous head. And I think we're getting about to where looks pretty good. Whoops. If you let it 
let the slack off or the tension off and go slack it will unroll on you and it just comes with practice the more you practice the better off you are finish this we'll finish it about four times well I screwed that one up the whip finishing takes a little practice Try it again. I gotta practice on this whip finishing. Five whip finishes should be good. Before I do that, I think I'll spread this out a little bit. Let that draw kind of ooze out. Put a feather through there. And then put the light on it. Never ceases to amaze me how this light, in a matter of just seconds, can dry this glue. I'm thinking my grandfather would think that was pretty cool. He used head cement. Actually, he used my grandmother's clear fingernail polish. And it took 10, 15 minutes to dry, where this just takes seconds. Well, I think that's a pretty good blood worm. Looks pretty yummy to me. I hope the fish like it. Dry as a bone. There it is. YouTube. A blood worm for the trout. Will it work? I don't know. Looks yummy to me. But I'm not a trout, so. <laughs> but that takes care of this uh, little episode, YouTube. I, uh, again, I appreciate you stopping by. I really do. I uh, hope you're all well. And until next time, take care of yourselves.